Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for coming on All Things Possible. Thank you guys for joining me this evening. I have a couple announcements to make really quick before I bring my friend on, my guest. Um, as you've seen, I asked James Duffy to come back on. I called and asked a question a couple of days ago. And when he uh, answered, I was like, oh my God, that was so good. It was such a different perspective. I asked him, let's go on a live and talk about that. So he's coming on to answer some questions. Usually we do interviews and we um, talk about people's journey and things that they do or, you know, different perspectives. But today is a discussion. So people who are joining in, I want you to be open-minded and share your point of view as well. All right. Okay. I see James is here. I see you. Okay. All right. So a couple of things that, like I was saying for the people who jump on. This is a discussion today. It's not really an interview. It's not really just a, um, a, a interview. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bring James on. Like I told you, I have a couple of questions I want to ask him. I also want to say really quick, I am so amazed and proud and in awe of seeing all the people that are opening up their own, um, I would say talk shows, but their own lives, their own podcasts, and people are joining together. We have so many people that are doing podcasts now. I want you guys to keep your eyes out for B Bradley and for Vivian. She's doing lives as well. Um, and yeah, our super tier, super hero, <laughs> superhero teams are rising up. All right. Also really quick, I put James Cash app um, in the title i'm also going to put it in the comments when we're done talking if your heart feels led to you know send a donation um it would be greatly appreciated all right i'm going to bring james on and we're going to start our discussion drum roll oh shit. i'm supposed to get the drum roll okay let's see it's gonna work and it works. <laughs> Hello, can you see me? I can see you. Can you see me? Yeah, can you hear good too? Can, I can hear good. Can you hear me pretty good? Okay. All right, I have to always check and make sure because sometimes, you know, one of them is not working or whatever. So I want to make sure everything right. is good. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Blessed. Always can you hear blessed. Me okay? I'm here breathing. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, let me make sure okay. the volume. I got this microphone okay, well, thing here that I got for um, when I do these lives and stuff, and we didn't have time yeah. to look it up today, so I'm gonna try it another time maybe. But uh, okay. as long as you can hear me, yeah, I can stuff. hear you good though. You can. Yeah, yeah. I turned my volume up. I can hear you good. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nope. Thank you for having me oh. on again. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. So I was just saying, like, usually I have interviews and we're asking questions about people's journey. But the other day when I called you and you gave an answer, it was such a different perspective than I have considered. Right. What happened? Oh, I thought you couldn't Nothing. hear. Yeah, so I wanted us to Are come we back still on. There? Uh... Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I want to start with my first question that I had for you. Okay, and I'm going to give a little bit of preference about why I asked you that question because my beliefs okay. are changing. And from what I believed when I was younger, you know, that we should all find a husband or a wife and get married. Right. Um, <clears throat> within the last two years or so, I started to realize for me, I think that the way certain churches, temple and mosques, and, and cultures believe are, I know are, are all different to consider into this, but I started wondering, is, is it supposed to be one person to, uh, you know, for a husband or wife for the rest of their lives? Because I've seen where people are unhappy 25 years living together and because the church has said they should stay together or the temple has said they should stay together. They stay together unhappy and they're unhappy their whole lives. Where if, a person if they're in a relationship and they can discuss and says i this is not working for me anymore and the other person and they can communicate they should be able to separate and go their own way but a lot of times i've seen where wives stay with husbands because the church said that's what they should do and so i had asked you do you what is your take on that like what do you view that as you know is it one person forever right right 
I don't know why you like to uh, stick me with these hard questions. On <laughs> trying to get me in trouble with some of the church folks. Uh, I, no, I just I want you. To <laughs> let me first uh, let me first put out my disclaimer. Okay. And that is that none of the answers that I share to any of your questions tonight will have anything to do with my personal preference, nor will they have to do with my personal experience. But they will okay. have to do with truth as I have come to know it. And this truth that I've come to know again, <clears throat> not based on my personal preference, not based on my personal experience for those that might try to take the answers and read into my life and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> It's just information and knowledge that has been accumulated over the years, information and knowledge from uh, scripture, from science, from biology, from history, from life in of itself, uh, measured by common sense and spiritual intuition. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's what these answers will be based on. Now, when we talked about this before, we went a little bit deeper, and it, it looks like your, your question uh, was a little bit deeper. But uh, just hearing your question now, uh, there are a number of, just looking at a man and a woman who has gotten married, mm -hmm. and they are, have come to a place of their life where it seems as if they're trying to force something that wasn't meant to be in the first place. Now mm -hmm. we've got to ask God, uh, or we've got to ask the reverend, we've got to ask the religion, or whoever is building the standard or the rule book, give us the rule book that we've got to follow to please God. Uh, yeah. Once you have missed God, is there room for repentance? And if repentance is not getting it right with God, then at what point can a man and a woman say, okay, maybe we did miss it? And shall we consider to try to force something that was never God's will in the first place? And this is mm -hmm. a problem that we run into when we look to outside forces to define for us what God's path and God's will is for our lives. We'll mm -hmm. constantly have to look to that outside force for permission and the know-how to get it right with God and for the permission and the know-how to find peace and real life within our lives. Because mm -hmm. now the question is, uh, should we have ever gotten married in the first place? And so when you go through things like that, I often just tell brothers and sisters that this is a big sign as to how careful we should be before we put ourselves in a woman or women before you allow a man to put himself in you, that be physically, mentally, or spiritually, because whether mm -hmm. you stay married or not, you're going to live with the consequence of tying your soul to that soul forever. So uh, the question that you asked me, uh, I think that that would be covered in that, you know, um, that would be covered in that. Now, I recall you asking me a question before and led us into uh, soul ties and the idea of soul mates and how many mm -hmm. soul mates can a person have yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes, and yes, we'll I deal did. with that. We'll go into that. Okay. And my disclaimer okay. still stands. None of it has to do with okay. my experience. <laughs> but just on, on that particular basis of two people that have gotten married, this is why, and we do back it up scripturally, uh, Jesus spoke about Moses and what Moses permitted in the law. And he talks about divorce in the New Testament. Share with us that Divorce was never God's perfect will. However, it was permitted, uh, basically because he knew that he was dealing was with marriage. Real. Say that again. Was marriage God's will? Well, yes, absolutely. But the, the question becomes, what is marriage? 
Now you can go by uh, the definition that we have here in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, for instance, you can go to the courthouse and uh, have a judge to sign a piece of paper to say that you're married and the man don't treat you right. So you get a sidekick and the, the government's eye and in most people's eye, they may say that, uh, that you are married to this man and that the sidekick you're committing adultery with. But could it be that mm -hmm. in God's eye, you're really more married to the sidekick and committing adultery to the one that you signed the piece of paper okay, with? Okay, now. <laughs> because God is not about slavery and bondage. He's not about signing a piece of paper and I own you. Oh, my goodness. But uh, marriage is when two souls are knit together and become one in love and loyalty and in respect. You have women who married men that they don't even like, let alone don't even know mm -hmm. them. But uh, I felt obligated because he paid my bills. I felt obligated because I was in a bad situation and he brought me out of it and he talked me up out of my slump that I was in. So I felt like I owed him something. So I think when it yeah. comes to marriage, if we just want to talk about the definition of marriage, God has given up on us in terms of what we call marriage, if you will. Yes, what we define. Oh, I love that. Yep. I can see that. I, I find that. that most answers are, most questions are answered within the definition of words. If we break down and define the words that we use, then we'll have a lot less questions. But what we do is we don't allow words to be pure anymore. We read our culture into words. We read our experience into words. And then we want to subjugate everybody else to our culture, to our experience, and to our definition of our word. Yeah. So what yeah. does marriage mean to a man? And what does marriage mean to God? I believe are two totally different things. Wow. That's the first time again I heard this put like that. I I think so too. I think so too. And then I guess the we can't really define because each one of us being God brings a different part of the definition as well. You know what I'm saying? So there's not one concrete answer either. I know that. And and having the discussion, I know that there's not one way to see this. That there are many different ways to see this. I think I this morning I made a video. Um, I write a whole bunch of these little things and I'd stick them around in my house you know and found and I found one that I wrote in 2018 that says there's not just one way of being not just one way of learning there are many different ways and times are changing so you know to be open to different ways of learning too um so I like that perspective and so what are you going to say about soulmates because you said you were going to get back to that because I like that because our definition between what God for me soulmates I, your soulmate, I, you know, they have a belief that you have one soulmate and that's the only person you're supposed to be. I don't believe that. Right. I believe that we can have many soulmates and even your friends and all that kind of stuff can be soulmates too. So, so what words, was your take on that? Words, and I think perhaps you've heard me say this before, that all words are significant, but no word is really sufficient to define mm -hmm. what the word was created to describe. All right. So we use words. Really, words are designed to paint a picture. Now, you know, I take the yeah. long way around now. If you want me to drive from, yeah. from Clermont to Orlando, <laughs> it's only a 30 minute ride, but I might drive you to Jupiter, Florida and to get to Orlando. So just go before and maybe all of your questions will be answered before you ask. It's OK. For instance, uh, you say, what is that bright thing that shines in the sky? You say, well, that's the sun the S-U-N, mm -hmm. and everyone would agree that's the sun, but that's really not the sun. Because whatever it was, it was that before the word sun ever showed up on this planet. We just no, agreed to use certain terminology for the sake of communication. Um, so if I say the word car, you don't see C-A-R. You see four wheels, four doors, six windows, or what have you, right? So words yeah. are simply yeah. used to paint a picture. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about marriage, 
between a man and a woman, but then it talks about marriage in terms of ministry. How that mm -hmm. the body of Christ is married to Christ. Now, Jesus is the head of the body. The church is the body. Jesus is the head of the body. So it's kind of like, what are you saying? You married yourself? What are you saying? Marriage is a word that is used to describe a oneness, a becoming one with. The two mm -hmm. shall become one. So mm -hmm. let's remove the word marriage, but we want to paint a picture to apply, to, to send across that same message. Let's use the word now or the term soulmate. Mm -hmm. Marriage. Oneness. Yes. Oneness. Yes, yes. <laughs> and for all of those who advocate the idea, which I believe is a, a true idea, that every time you connect with the soul, there is a soul tie, then maybe you guys will appreciate the correlation between the word marriage and the term soulmate. Because every time you lay sisters with a man, there's a marriage taking place. Wow. And this Again. is why after the ceremony, they would jump the room and go in the, the room and you leave them alone so they can what consummate, make real. Make yes, certain. same thing in the Indian culture, as soon as, yeah. That's Marriage. what they do. All right. Yeah. So, that having been said, let's first look at the term soulmate in general, just in terms of definition. If you take the word soul and mate and define those two words, a lot mm -hmm. of your answers will come just in breaking down that definition. And then we'll transition over into soulmate as it has become in our own minds, uh, being that relationship between a man and a woman laying together in a bed. Yeah. All right. Okay. But soulmate. All right. Soulmate, the idea is simply that two human beings cross paths and they make a connection that seems to be natural. Would you agree? Oh, I love that. Yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah. You have relationships, whether it be a friendship. Soulmates don't have just have to be sexual. I mm -hmm. remember um, hearing Timberland. You remember Timberland and Magoo? Timberland yeah. talked about uh, when he met uh, Missy Elliott. And they made wonderful music together. But he talked about when they yeah. first met, he, he described their relationship as being one of meeting a soulmate. It wasn't nothing sexual about it. It was just the music. Her yeah. voice and her lyrics was a perfect match for what I was envisioning in terms of music. So when we came together, there was no wrestle. There was no struggle. We make a hit after hit and song after song. And it was a flow. Yeah. It was easy as if it was meant to be. I found a soulmate in business. Oh. Um, now, yeah. how many business partners can you have at one time? How many soulmates can you have at one time in terms of business? How many friends can you have at one time? You don't meet one friend and say, okay, this is my friend. I'm not allowed to have any yeah. more friends. And <laughs> if that person is jealous because you say you've got another friend, now you're going to question, is this Good point. Good point. <laughs> That is a good point. <laughs> so when we start thinking in terms of only one, we limit ourselves to our own ability. How many more partners could Timberland meet that they can produce such levels of success in music just by a flow? Now, you know what it is to meet somebody and you feel like you're obligated to deal with them, but there is no flow there. Mm -hmm. Everything is a wrestle. Mm -hmm. Everything is a mm -hmm. struggle. Some people are married today and that's how they feel. It's I a know struggle. It. Yeah. It's a wrestle. Yeah. I miss God. I miss nature. I miss purpose. I miss whatever it is that I missed. I missed it. Notice that the sperm never missed the egg because it's being guided by something that's sharper than any preacher or any rule book or any religion or any book. Notice that baby never misses that breast when it's time to draw milk 
because it's being guided by something. What is this thing that's guiding us into flawed relationships? I oh, know. wow. It's a rhetorical oh. question, but it's something to think about. My God. Well. <laughs> there has to be a relationship that we're in that there is a struggle, there is a push, there is a wrestle. Or should it all be a flow? So, when you have two souls that come together and there is a flow there, now, I want to answer this question very basic and very surface real quick. You say, is it possible that there be one, you know, they give the idea that one man is made for one woman as if God is playing this game where he has this one soul before the foundation of time that he created just for you. He put that soul somewhere over in Brazil, but then put you in America. Now, if you don't end up going to Brazil one day or Brazil don't come to you, then you got no the chances of ever meeting your soul, mate. But I'm going to let you go through all this hell until you get the right one that I'm going to say, yeah, you got it. <laughs> that, I tell you straight up, I don't believe. I don't believe. I don't believe so either. <laughs> <clears throat> Hold on here. Go ahead and let me, let, me, let me make sure my mind don't leave you. <laughs> but that is a good point. That is a good point. <clears throat> I love, I, there's a couple of things you hit on that to me was a good point, but so you're you're talking about one. Mm. Hold on, you made I lost my my th train of thought. <laughs> so is that just this one out there? All right, we're answering on surface. Is it possible that there are others? Well, look at your own experience. I'm sure yeah. that just like you had to be in a relationship that you had to force it, I'm sure that you have been in a relationship, whether it been male versus female, male and female rather, or whether it was business or whatever, you've been in a relationship. Yeah. Uh, let's just go ahead and let's just horn in now on the male and the female relationship. That's all. Yeah, yeah, that, okay. That's all. Yeah. Uh, just look at your own experience. You were with someone before and everything was perfect. You would have blessed this relationship as being a soulmate. Let's say, for instance, one of them passed, one of them died. Mm -hmm. gone. Right. You met somebody else and you were just as good. It was just a flow there too. So is it possible to have more than one soulmate in your lifetime? Look at your own experience and let the church say amen. Amen, because that's right. how I recognize it. Right. Preacher, <laughs> reverend, reverend, you've been with somebody before? And things went well. Now, maybe you wanted to be with somebody else, but you were faithful there and things went well. Whether that spouse passed away and some dirty folk want out so bad, they'll even kill their spouse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to move on to another one, to play this game, this hypocritical game of rules and standards. And it's a bad thing when I trap myself in my own rule book. Now I got to murder oh, somebody. To... Anyway, I don't know where that oh, comes man, from. That was... But I promise you it's out there. It was real. Yeah. So you have had more than one soulmate in your life. Put it like that. You've had more than one in your life. So to answer that question, of course there can be more than one. So now let's tighten up on the yeah. question a little bit. The question then becomes, can we have more than one at a time? Now, one more time, and this will be my last time, but I'm putting out my disclaimer. This has nothing to do with me, my perception, has nothing to do with my experience. But based on what I've learned over the years, when I measure it against common sense and spiritual intuition, I will say this. My answer begins this way. If you can imagine it, it is possible. If you can imagine it, is it possible to have more than one soulmate? And we're talking sexually now, male and female. Mm -hmm. is, it more, is it possible to have more than one at a time? If you can imagine it, it's possible. But there, I, I can hear Keith sweat in my ear. There's a right and a wrong way to love somebody. There's a right way and there is a wrong way to do anything. 
And when you yeah. do things the wrong way, you will bear the consequence of what you do. And that's the world that we live in today. But it doesn't yeah. mean that what you imagined was impossible. It just means that you went about it the wrong way. In the Western Hemisphere, just in case I have religious darts flying at me, let me back them up a little bit with scripture and with history. <laughs> in the Western Hemisphere, it's lawful, it's legal, it's acceptable to have one son. Mm -hmm. In, you know what? It's a question that has to be asked with this. What is acceptable to God versus what is acceptable with man? And as you go from culture to culture with your scriptures, you'll find out that what is acceptable with God is nine times out of ten that which man has accepted in their culture as being accepted. In wow. some states, right here in America, it's legal right now to smoke marijuana. In other states, mm -hmm. it's not legal. The states where it is not legal to smoke marijuana, if you try to please God, call yourself Christian or whatever, you smoke that marijuana and your consciousness is going to be vexed. You're going to be bothered. Why? Because it's not so much you're breaking God law, you're breaking man law as you know it. But go to a culture where they do it religiously and they don't think twice about it. I wonder if they are convicted for smoking marijuana. Now look, whatever oh. fits your mind, don't let no man tell you that that ain't sin for you. But if something don't convict you, does it take you out of yourself? Don't let nobody put no restrictions on you that God didn't put on you. And I'm just making this that? point so that you can see how the rules of God vary based upon where you are and what is acceptable yeah. in that place by the man. It seems to me as if that man is the God that you're trying to please. So then so is the, the consciousness, the guilt, the, the what is sin according to them um, based on where you are in a sense. Because Absolutely, what, because your I, conscious, your the conscience is built up on what, what it is city? taught. Yes. Information. The mm -hmm. thing that told the baby to latch on to the breast was information, but it was natural information. Any information outside of nature becomes information that leads you to a vexation of your conscience. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. I like so that. now some mm -hmm. things may have originally been not sinful, but today it's sinful. Why? Because a certain kind of consciousness has been built in this universe. Yeah. And until yeah. that consciousness is removed, then the act of sin is still there. See, because sin is never with the act. The sin is always with the mindset. Ain't no sin in marijuana. Sin is in your head. And if sin is in your head, marijuana, cocaine, alcohol, anything, wine, anything is going to make you more sin. Yes. It is in the mind. Bam. I think, bam. <laughs> it's matters That's of the it. heart. This is why the word repent means to rethink and reconsider. You do not turn back to God by way of lifestyle. You turn back to God by way of thinking. All right, now. <laughs> I told you. you get now, started. new thinking will produce new lifestyle, but new lifestyle will never produce new thinking. This is why you can no. take a hog out of the hog pen and wash him up and put a silk suit on him. But the moment he sees slop, he's going back in it. Why? Because his neck right hasn't been changed. It. And you can take a snake and dress him up and put a wig on him and look at him like a man and call him a man. But the moment he has a flashback to his neck and he'll bite you. And right you'll say, why did you bite me? He'll say, man, you knew I was a snake when you found me. <laughs> 
There was no change. Oh my goodness. Yes. All right. I got that. All right. So I received that. All right. So all right. So that's on that. That's so that's Jesus. That. I know we can so, Yeah, man. My God. In the Go New ahead. Testament, he said more. that marriage was never intended by God, but it was permitted by God because God knew he was dealing with weak-minded men who was going to get themselves into something to get tied up and tangled up. And if I just leave them in that mess forever, that's just like you tell your child, don't touch that stove. He touched that stove, he done burned yourself. You're not just going to say, well, you just sit there and deal with it. No, you're going to go get some butter or something. You're going to doctor him up. You're going to heal him. Yeah, yeah. Thank God for being a God of forgiveness and healing. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's a right and a wrong way to do anything. When two souls, and, and, and mind you, in most countries today, it is lawful, legal, acceptable, normal for a man to have more than one wife. Mm -hmm. It's in the Western Hemisphere that we run into the problem, and that's where God gets a conscience at, a conscience at, and he begins to call this polygamy thing sin when you get to America. Mm -hmm. But if you go over there to Muslim mm -hmm. nations mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff like that, then that, that God over there, he don't have the same conscience. Now, how many gods are there? And how big is it? Does he change his mind about something here and there, or are we changing our minds about something and using our own perception to control the minds and the masses of the people? I think the latter is more so what we're dealing with. I think so, too. Now, now, don't get it twisted now and say, well, I want to go over there with them because they can have as many women as they want. No, there are certain rules, I'd imagine, that comes with their culture. There are certain rules and regulations that come with this thing now. Because mm -hmm. if you don't follow the rules and don't do this thing the right way, you're going to be in a mess. I believe that two souls must first be mutual. It must be a mutual agreement. If there is not a yes. mutual coming together in those two souls, then this is taking something. They call that rape where we're from. What is it? Rape. How do you... Okay, okay. R... Mm -hmm. A, I want to be real clear for somebody who feels like they can take from a woman or take from a man without mutual consent. R-A-P-E. Now, if you don't get okay. it from me, you go try it, and you'll get it from behind cell bars. They will teach you. All right? So there must be mutual consent. But if you're going to talk about multiple relationships now, it must not only be mutual between the two, but there is a third party out there because maybe the one you're in a mutual agreement with, maybe they are connected to somebody else too because wherever there is a soul mate, there is a soul tie. Yeah. And she might feel like she's single, but she might be laid up with some third party out there who feel like they together. So his energy is coming through her into the bed with y'all. Yeah. I'm yes. You hear what I'm saying now? I did, yeah. So now you've got conflict in the universe. Even though these two are mutual, it's a third party out there that's not in mutual agreement. That's going to affect you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. that one has to be now. Who are they connected to? And this thing go all the way back, just like that. Yeah. So yeah. so so don't let nothing I say make you feel like oh man, the preacher say, the prophet say, or MacDuffie say, whatever you want to call me these days. I'm just a man. I am that I am. <laughs> this dude say that we can go have who we want to have. All right. Don't put that in my mouth. Yeah, you can do what you want to do, but you're gonna bear the consequence. Yeah. And this world is bearing consequence today, right? And so now by the time we get all messed up, by the time you have jealousy in the world, by the time you have envy in the world, and your mind is messed up too, so you don't know who to trust, who not to trust. You don't know what you're tying yourself to in a soul tie, right? So, so I mean, it can get very dangerous. And diseases are coming now because of this and all kinds of stuff. And by the time you get to Paul's day, 
Paul is saying, man, you know, I wish all of you were just given the gift like I was given the gift of celibacy the way you just ain't with nobody. So the question is how many, <laughs> not how many women can you have, it's how many women can you handle? And if you're living in a world where people typically don't even know themselves, then brother, it's more to being with a woman than just laying yourself inside of her. Can you cultivate that woman? You don't even know who you are. You don't even know who you are. How can you stand? You can't take care of yourself. How can you stand to talk about taking care of one woman, let alone two or three other women? So Paul said, man, I wish all of y'all, because we need so much work on our heart and our heads. I wish all of you could just forget about sexual relationship and let's focus on ministry. But yeah, he had enough reason. common sense to know that that was not the case. So, so, so if you're going to have a sex drive, then I permit you, Paul says, go get yourself a woman. Marry mm -hmm. your own woman, which was not a sign of him saying, okay, God is laying down the law that only one woman can, only one man can have one woman. But what he's saying is, is don't bother nobody else's woman. Because back then, you know, women were like property. And that's like stealing. He says, have your own woman. And he yeah. certainly would not adjure you to have more than one woman. You're talking to a man who's telling you he wishes you ain't have a desire for no woman. So you bring me that Paul yeah. stuff without understanding. Because then I'm going to ask yeah. you, how many wives did Abraham have? How many wives did Moses have? How many wives did David have? By the way, Bathsheba became the wife of David, and the first child that they had died because of how he handled that relationship with Bathsheba and Uriah. But then the next child Bathsheba had lived, and it was, and then Solomon had a thousand wives. My God from the <laughs> and if you look at scripture, the problem that, that was had with him and all his wives were not just that he had that number, but that he married certain kinds of women who, who worshiped certain kinds of gods. And he got intermixed and intermingled with their histories and their worship of their gods and their cultures. And it all got into that issue where he ran into an issue with God through the women. But he had 300 wives, 700 concubines. All of them were a type of wife. Were these men favored by God? Were they sinners? We look at them as the champions of our faith. All right, so my disclaimer is out there. I'm not telling nobody to do nothing that, that God ain't putting your heart to do. I hope that answer makes a little bit of sense. It does to me. If anybody has any questions, you can leave that in the comment. I'm sure you'll, you'll attend to it later if you see it. Say that again? <clears throat> okay. I said, if anybody has any questions, I tell them, leave it in the comment and you'll attend to the, okay. to your answer, right? On that one. All right. All right. So still keeping the, the topic a little bit kind of like on, um, on God <laughs> is I was thinking the other day too, I was talking to, to one of my friends and well, I actually wrote it down so I don't forget. Okay. So I was on a topic of, you know, uh, having a, a, a child for me I, that was the closest identification i can understand to what god is must feel like okay because when i looked at this this being that was in my hand the eyes that were made in me the nose that was made in me the hair that was made in me and i look at this being and i love so much i would protect against anybody right we know all know that we're all protect our children most parents will protect their children so their child grows up and is growing up and in the midst of growing up makes a mistake let's say you have one that um does something small like don't do their homework or don't pass a grade or whatever you get upset and you yell at that kid and you tell them to do better but you're not going to stay mad at that kid forever let's even take it a little bit further and say you have a parent that has a child that murdered a person or massacred people you're so disappointed in that child, but the parent of that child usually still loves the child. That's they right. said they need to serve and do whatever they need to do, but okay. they still love that child. I am a little bit, I don't believe, I'm just going to say out there, that God says, I'm going to let you burn forever and ever 
if you sin against something I do. First of all, the whole concept of sin, you kind of just broke down to something I believe. It is in the mind of a consciousness of a belief anyways. So why? And I know that's a hard one, I think, to answer. I'm watching because I know too. I know. Look, the reason all things possible was created was I was in the, I have a lot of church friends. I was in the, and they, the conversation and the conflicts that would happen, I wanted to be out of it. And so I created all things possible until I'm to the point now where I just say what I believe. Okay. That's right. I don't and I believe God is punishing I'm not sure. And actually the answer, okay, good. And actually this question. <laughs> I know. That's why I told you to come on. Yeah. And actually I know, this question is a little on. lighter than you may think it is these days. Okay, good. Okay. Because you... we have men that have gone before us that have really caught a lot of punches and a lot of hits for this. And we are coming to a place now where even a lot of pastors who may not say it publicly on Sunday mornings, but when they get in their private chambers, they will admit that they don't know that hell is what it has been interpreted to be. Mm. Now, let me say very first and foremost that there is a place called hell. And hell is very, very real. I think the same place. Hell is There's so an actual real. place? Say that again. I said you believe it's an actual place? Absolutely. Just okay. as actual as this world is that we are living in right now. Okay. The spirit world produces the natural world. But there is no spiritual world other than the world that's going on in your head. So real mm -hmm. heaven and real hell is in your head. Oh, yeah. That which is in your head is so real that it has it created is. what you live in. Today. All these walls. Yeah. Some yeah. people wonder. I was talking to a brother the other day. I said, man, who's scared of hell when earth is this hot? <laughs> <laughs> man, some people go to hell and ask the devil, man, have you been to Scott Street? Have you been to Blue Street? Have you been to Florida? <laughs> But I want you to notice how our imagination has created a world with a hole in the ozone leak, has created a world where the sun burns so hot. We are in hell today. And we are only in hell because hell has been in us. All right, it yeah. was simpler than I thought. <laughs> yeah. And there is, and we'll never be able to escape this, we talk about God and forgiveness. We talk about children being born to mothers. One thing, the mother may love that child that murdered somebody, but that child will have to pay the consequence. David went down in history as a man after God's own heart, but every day of his life on this earth, he paid a price for what he did to Uriah. Mm -hmm. He had to deal with the embarrassment of his own son sleeping with one of his wives on the rooftop of his palace. He had to deal with the uprising of his own son against him had to deal with the murder of his own son for rising against him. So there is consequence and there is repercussion. We have to stop thinking selfishly. If we're ever going to tap into eternal life again, we can no longer see ourselves as the all in all, but we can only see ourselves now as one link in the chain of humanity. If you see yourself as one link in the chain of humanity, you will find it to be so true that no man gets away from the seed that he sowed. Because you may not reap your evil deed in your lifetime, but what you are doing today, you're setting up consequences for your children 
and for your children's children. And while God does forgive, one thing will not be forgiven. And I just want to address this while it's on my mind. When you take a people from their own land and wipe their minds clean of knowledge, knowledge of self, knowledge of God, knowledge of truth, their own history, when you take their names from them and put your name on them like they are a piece of cattle, I don't care how long it takes, you will pay for that. God will find you. Well, let me go ahead and just change that word up a little bit. God ain't going to find you. Nature will catch up with you sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're dealing with today. Nature is catching up with some folks. Because a long time ago, some wickedly wise men had an agenda. And they knew as wickedly and wisely as they were that in order to fulfill this agenda, it ain't going to happen overnight. It could take some 200, 300, 400 years for this agenda to come into fruition. I'm not going to live to see it. Mm -hmm. They were so dedicated to their agenda, and they had so much sense that they knew that they were just one link in the chain of humanity, that they knew that if I could just perpetuate this thought in the minds of my children, it will continue on. It will continue. But everything, Sister Prudence, that has a beginning has an end. So mm -hmm. these wickedly wise men look down throughout the eons of time. It was John Adams, I think, maybe Jefferson, don't mark me. You look up the quote, you'll find the right name. But one of those founding fathers said, and don't mark my words, but it's something to the nature of saying, when I think of the righteousness of God and the justice of God, I cringe at the idea that God is just. And what he was saying was that sooner or later, somebody's going to pay for what we are doing. When they brought us here to this hemisphere, they knew what they were doing. They knew how long it would take for them to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. But my question is, is once you reach the peak of what you're trying to accomplish, then what? Life keeps on moving. You got to go somewhere. If your goal of success, if your picture of success is to be rich, then what's left for you after you get all the money on the planet? You will have to be broke now. Exactly. Yes. Yes. If your oh. measure of success, if your idea of success is to be somebody, then what are you going to do when you become somebody? There's nowhere left for you to go but down to nobody. This is yes. where we are today. And the book says that the, the sins of the fathers were passed down to four, to third, to down even to the third and the fourth generation. generation. And so there are some whites that say, hey man, we didn't do this to you guys. Why must we pay a price? Because God is the truth and nature is accurate. And because your fathers knew what they were doing, somebody's got to pay the price sooner or later. But to everybody that has been down, it's time to rejoice now because there's nowhere for you to go but up. For those that have been bound, there's nowhere to go but freedom. For those that have been broke, there's nowhere to go but wholeness. So in order to fix the world, all you got to do is just flip the world around. You know, it don't take a whole lot of work. All you got to do is just get up and turn the tables. And the first becomes last and the last becomes first. I didn't mean to go off mm -hmm. down that lane, down that time. That I, I, I no, that's okay. Man, no, don't be sorry. That's how. I said, no, don't be sorry. That's how it, it was led. And I got it. I, I got from it. That's. I got from it what I needed. I hope you guys got what you needed. <laughs> but God is a forgiver. God is a forgiver. He is needed. so much a forgiver that 
And I'm going to stick with the issue at hand. I'm going to stick with the issue at hand. Because there is a recompense, a reward that is coming to Caucasians for what they have done. But God is so righteous. I want you to notice how that in Egypt's experience, if you look in Exodus, the Bible said when the Hebrews came out of Egypt that there was a mixed multitude that came out with them. In other words, there were more people there being oppressed than just Egyptians. Or than just Hebrew. It was the suffering of the Hebrew that brought the deliverer on the scene. But when the deliverer shows up, everybody that wants to be free can be free. Mm. So this is not an indictment against Caucasians by large. Because just as sure as you have one that is sympathetic to our suffering, and willing not to make an excuse, but to apologetically say, what can I do to help your cause? You will be with us in the new world. God is that forgiving. As a matter of fact, most are afraid of black people coming to power because they inwardly fear that what we did to you guys, you guys won't turn around and do to us. Not realizing that we really do have the nature of God and we ain't thinking about getting even with nobody. We yeah. just want to love everybody. <laughs> God is good. God is awesome. All the God time. Awesome. All the time. I love it. Oh, man. I think that's it. That's, that was the two questions I had for me. I... <clears throat> A lot of what you said, too, I'm digesting still. I'm not going to lie, right? Because I have been studying by myself for so long. I said, one mom, I, I was brought up Hindu and Christian. My mom said, at 12 years old, I think it was, because I wow. went to her and I was like, how was that? Coming up Hindu and Christian. I, yes. At 12 years old, I remember, we came out of living, I'm not 12, I was 12 in America, so I must have been like 10 years old. My brother... And I, I was bound down praying in the room, doing my prayers. And my brother came up to me and said, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? There's only one God. I was like, what do you mean there's only one God? He's like, there's only one God. There's only Jesus. And I, I was blown because I was going to church on Sundays. And we would go to the temples on other days. I didn't know they were teaching that there was only one God. And so I went to ask my mom, there's only one God? Or one, and my mom said, you are going to have to go through your journey yourself. I've introduced you to God. Now you have to find out who God is yourself. I, you're free to choose whatever religion you want to. Just know that there's something bigger than you. And so I always tell people, for me, Jesus is my savior. Because when I was looking for a friend, when I was looking for a guide, you know, he was my father because my father wasn't there for a long time. I mean, he was my everything. Jesus showed up for me. And for 17 years, I studied the word of God. And at first, I took in what everybody was telling me what God was. And at a certain point, I have to stop and says, no, I want to find out what God is for me, That's right. for me. And, and I had to pull away from everybody else's teaching and study for myself. So when I read the Bible, there's words I have it written on here to me does not fit in the same thought of what I feel God to be like vengeance. I don't see God as a vengeance God, but I know a lot of people believe God to be vengeance. And so I'm not taking away or trying to convince anybody of what I believe. I'm just telling you my experience brought me to believe that God was so much more bigger than what any church or the temple was teaching to me. But parts of what they taught was and is God for me. Do you understand? Does that make sense? But, but like, so certain definitions I can take from people and it fits into my understanding from my experience what God is. But it doesn't necessarily always, I don't always have to believe what everybody else does. Like, I don't see God as a vengeful God. I don't see God as trying to um, separate good from bad. I believe all of it plays a part. A lot, a lot of what messes God. us up is Greek mythology. And the way Why do you that, say that the way that truth, remember when I told you that words are just used to paint pictures? I mean, these guys mm -hmm. paint a crazy picture, man. And so we see the devil yeah, with the pitchforks and hell with this fire and all this kind of stuff. And that, that and Jesus was blonde hair. Bad yeah. word on revenge. But if you look at revenge and what it means, uh, could you understand it in terms of what I shared 
you reap what you sow. It's, it's, it's not an angry God that's sitting up on the throne somewhere waiting on the time to come jump down and get on your behind. No, the vengeance <laughs> of God is simply nature, your seeds catching up with you. That's all it is. I mean, and James, that's why one of the reasons I wanted you to come on and why I asked you to come on because, and I know you were kind of like flabbergasted when I said that, you were like, wait, say that again. But a lot of what is being taught in the church, you are saying it, but you are saying it in a in a way that is real. I, I want to say real time, yes. real life. It's not a fairy tale. It's you. not a movie. The way you say it to me, I, yeah. So, and that's why I actually come back on because I want to see that people. So now, what you're helping me to understand and to see now is that. There can be people in the church or the temples and know the truth <laughs> and speak on the truth and kind of help people understand who is stuck. I've seen some of the crowd, I think I was telling you, listening to like one of your sermons and and they were getting it. And I was like, oh, you're, you're saying, you know, what the truth is to me anyways. And they were getting it. And I'm not used to seeing, especially an older crowd saying, yes, yes, yes. They're usually fighting against what you're saying, but you're speaking what's in the Bible, but you're speaking it from a diff. And I, so that's why I actually because the interpretation <laughs> is what makes the difference. The picture painted yeah. is what makes the difference. And and I try yeah. to be. I, 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 you, you got to have cushion with church folk, man, and with religious people. Period. Religion. Period. I'm not even put on yeah. all this on just on Christian. Yes, yeah. religious no, people. It, period. And that's why I say temple. Once you get them soft enough to hear you, then you'll be okay. Because what I found is that most people are saying the right. Matter of fact, when you talk about the three monotheistic religions, uh, when you talk about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all three of them are really saying the same thing. They're just speaking three different languages. Yes. And so we fight over language. Yes. And language produces yeah. interpretation. So yeah. Christians say the same thing. They say a particular thing out of the Bible. But my business and what God's gift to me is, is to help them lift their head out of the scripture and see it in the real world. Don't just leave oh, it in the imaginary oh. world because if you're looking for a guy to come down on, on the cloud, now he's five foot seven, five foot eight. He's coming down <laughs> on a cloud that don't hold weight. It's not a big ball of cotton, you know. It's it's really nothing. It's just an illusion. He's coming down, on, and the whole world's going to see him. Now, it's <laughs> light on this side of the world. Over there in China somewhere is dark, but the whole world going to see him. Now, don't tell me we're looking for that, but we're not looking for a tin-headed monster to come up out of the sea for him to fight. And don't tell me I can't eat popcorn while I watch this unfold. See, when you give it back to them like that, they're like, yes. you know what, I never really even thought about this. I, but the fact of the matter is, like, is, if he's coming back, should we be looking for him? And what does yes. he look like? What does it look like, the coming of God? And when we seriously start thinking about those things, oh, we will find that he's not coming, baby. He's already here, and he's at work. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Next. No, that's it for me today. Right. You got me all enough right. meat. Am I, You're am nothing I like my oh, friend Hakeem. Hakeem will literally keep me all night long if I want to stay all night long. You are nothing like him. I know. You just ask two, three questions. <laughs> I know. I love it too. I know that's what I'm saying. I know we can go on and and on, but I, I think that's it for you. tonight. Look, same here. You know, again, you're always welcome back. Thank you so much yes. for coming on and sharing that. I wanted to hear your perspective of it. I love your perspective of it. You have given me a plate of food to sit down and marinate on. So, Did thank anybody you. have any questions out there? Yeah, if anybody is on, I know Vivian was saying some stuff here. Yeah, Let's Vivian, tell see. Ms. Vivian, I said thank you. Ms. Vivian, give me a good shout out there. Tell Ms. Vivian, I said thank you. Yes, yeah, she is. She hears you, Vivian. Somebody thinks she, she, she look. Oh, she's just saying she was just going along with what you're saying. Oh, she said, Thank okay. you very much. She is on, yes. And yeah. she was going, she was laughing. And how you say you take the long road. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sometimes I aggravate myself. With that, but I promise you, it will be a oh. thorough, a 
understanding. He says she was also raised in fire and brimstone. He's saying it in a freeing way. He speaks about God without all the fear. That's exactly my point. Without all the fear. Hold on. Without all the fear, I jumped in. And rules. Once I let go of all the rules, God became so much bigger. That's right. And you become the rule. God becomes the rule. Love becomes the rule. She said, how did you start preaching the way you do? Uh, you know what? For, for, first of all, let me say, and this will help with the answer there. First of all, let me say that when, when we talk about the generations that brought us up, I, I, I don't give them a hard time because let me be very clear. They did exactly what they were supposed to do the way that they were supposed to Absolutely. Do. According to Bible prophecy, wisdom, true wisdom, was supposed to be hidden from mankind for a certain time. And that is because if according to Genesis, uh, man choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is kind of him saying, God, I can create life better than you can. I'll use my own wisdom. I don't need your wisdom, which is the wisdom of nature. And so God cuts man off. This is the storyline of prophecy throughout scripture. God cuts you off for 6,000 years. At the end of that time, he will come back to reveal truth. But truth has been hidden. And he has gradually revealed himself. Uh, so every scripture and every generation was just a finger pointing in a certain direction. This is why when yes, Jesus sir. showed up, he says, I'm not against Moses. I am what Moses was pointing towards. But Jesus also pointed in the future, and now you find little MacDuffie, and I'm here to say, I'm not against Jesus. I'm saying <laughs> what Jesus was pointing towards. Right. So, so I would it's have so to true. say that I was born for this. And if you think I'm something, listen to my nephews and my nieces and listen to your own nephews and your nieces. These kids are born with this. See, Christ yes. is in the earth today, but Christ is the influx of human souls that are born into the world with a certain kind of consciousness, a certain kind of understanding. I couldn't help but talk See like what this. I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. Not everybody in, in the So I don't take credit for this. The only thing I can give credit to for this is God, the universe, its own wisdom to produce somebody like me at this time. We live in a very special time. So if you understood what time it was, you'll understand who I am. I'm the Elijah you're looking for. I'm the Jesus you're looking for. Not Vivian because said, of me. So and, 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 I, and this thought came to mind when you were talking about it. There is one God, but there are many Jesuses. Oh. One God, but many Jesus. And every time Jesus comes, he comes to, re to reveal God. But, uh, but personally, though, I, I would like, I, I mean, I would have to give a shout out to, to our, our, a dear man in my life, a, a spiritual father to me, uh, uh, Prophet Joy, who's passed away now. He's transitioned now. But he laid his hands on me, and he blessed me with a desire and a love for God's word, to break it down word for word. He was a Caucasian man, big, long white beard. And when I would travel with him, We'd be in the back uh, office on the hotel room getting ready, and he would be getting dressed in the mirror, just quoting scriptures. He would like read an entire chapter out of the Bible without even looking at it, just quote it off the top of his head, enter a recorder, then play it back to himself. And that made me fall in love with words and the word of God. And my spiritual father, he's still living today. I thank God for Curtis Lake III. Apostle Curtis Lake III laid his hands on me. And he gave me a great uh, passion for revelation. For, uh, and, and after spending a little time with that man, I began to read scriptures and they didn't look the same anymore. I began to see them oh, in wow. real time. And then T.D. Jake said something that blessed me. T.D. Jake said when he reads a text, he tries to get the context by putting himself in the picture. If you read about Jesus walking down the streets of Galilee, he would put a pair of sandals in, in, in his mind's eye. He would have sandals himself walking down that road. I try to make things look real, feel real, 
And from that desire and just spending time in worship with God, God has just blessed me with this vision, this sight. Your eyes just come open. Yeah. There ain't but one way for you to see a thing when your eyes come open, baby. You see it as it really is. So there's nothing special about me. I just see things as they really are. Vivian said the scripture was like your GPS guidance. She was like, Amen. And that's all scripture is. And when you're getting, when you get to your destination, you what? Turn your GPS off. So there is a spirit in the word of God. When you get the spirit of the Bible out of the Bible, you really never have to read the Bible again. Yes. Because it's just a finger yes. pointing you somewhere. That right there, that's it. All right, we're GPS is for people who are lost. When you're found, you don't need a GPS. And I'm like, Jesus, man, I am the Torah. I am the Bible. I am the word that you're reading. But now you don't have to read it. Just look at me. When you see me, you've seen the Father. When you hear me, you're yes. hearing from the Father. And I mean every word that I say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. I think that's a beautiful way to say good night. All right. God bless you. I thank you so much for the invitation. Can't wait to come back. Yeah. You know you're going to be welcome back again. I hey, uh, tell Miss Vivian, tell, tell Vivian again, you put my cash app up. I could have been a comedian. I was just going to. I could have been a comedian too. But the thing about comedians, what makes them so funny is that they really serious and they really real, even though it's laughing and a joking man. All right. You tell me, yeah, yeah, yeah. you put my cash app up <laughs> and everybody else is tuning in. They put that cash app up and you keep it, you keep it coming. Paul said, if I take care of your spiritual needs, it's only right that you look out for my natural. Blessings on you, Miss yeah. Kendall. I enjoyed you so much. Blessings, <laughs> blessings. I'll talk to you soon. All right. You have a good night. Bye bye. All right. All right. I, I'm so serious. I feel full. When I'm done doing these lives, the joy that runs through my veins, if you put an aura light or you know how they can read frequencies, you would see, you would see it. You could feel it off me. As a matter of fact, I usually have to turn down my AC to like 70 because I do. My uh, vibration rises so much and I love it. I love it. I love the different perspective. I love that we are able to talk to each other from different cultures, different walks and still connect. I think there's so much I want to say, but again, I'm just like, it was good. I hope it was good for you too. Join me tomorrow. I have another beautiful guest. Wait till you see what she does. I appreciate all of you. I love you. Have a good night.